How do we know that logic works the way it's supposed to work? Well, we prove it. And when you're proving stuff about how logic works, you're doing meta logic. Let me show you how it goes. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago, I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. In this video and the next, I'm going to walk you through the beginnings of metalogical reasoning, how we do reasoning, not within logic, but about logic, trying to establish that logic works in a certain way, trying to establish that it works the way we want it to work. So if that sounds good to you, do me a favor before we get going, give this video a big old thumbs up, hit subscribe and hit that bell icon to get notifications. So often when we're doing MetaLogic, we want to establish that entailment or our proofs or whatever have certain properties. So we've got this entailment relation, we've got some premises and a conclusion. This here, it's a relation like any other, so we might want to work out what properties does it have. Is it a reflexive relation? Yeah. Is it a symmetrical relation? Nope. Is it a transitive relation? Yeah, it turns out it is, at least in most standard logics, but how do we check that? How do we know that for sure? Well, we do some reasoning to work out. When we do that, it's metalogic. Similarly, we've got this proof relation, right? We can take some premises, X, and some conclusion, A, and we can try and prove the conclusion from the premises. But again, how does that work? What kind of relationship is it? And, and here we build up to the soundness and completion results. What relationship does this have to this? Well, we know what we want it to do. We want to be able to prove A from the premises, just in case it really does follow from the premises. In other words, if we can prove something, we want it to be true. Okay, that would be good because if our proof system allows us to prove things that we shouldn't be able to prove, it's just no use at all. So we want to be able to say, if we prove it, then it really is true. That's called soundness. Also, we'd like to know that we can get hold of all the things we want to get hold of. So if it's a true entailment, can we prove it? So if it's an entailment, then we can prove it. That's called completeness. It allows our proof system to get at all the truths there are in that system of entailment, okay? So from there to there is called completeness. Some of the systems we're going to look at, they're complete. Some of them aren't. How do we go about establishing this relationship between, as it were, proof and truth, entailment and a system of deduction? Well, we can't do that within the proof system because we're trying to work out something about the proof system. OK, so there we're looking at metalogic, trying to establish this relationship between here and here. So that's what we're going to look at next week. But before we get to that, in this video, I want to walk you through the basic ideas and the basic strategies of metalogical reasoning. So I think the best way to do that is take a really simple example, something that's obviously true and say, OK, but how do we prove that it's true? So let's look at this example. OK, what have we got here? We've got a conditional if then sentence saying that if we've got some premises which entail a conjunction, A and B, then the same premises also entail the conjunction B and A. In other words, as far as entailment's concerned, if you're entailing a premise that's a conjunction, it doesn't matter which way round that conjunction goes. OK, now we know this is true because when we were looking at the truth tables, we were saying that conjunction is commutative. That means A and B has the same semantics, the same truth condition. It's true in the same situations as B and A. So we could just say, yeah, well, that's obviously true because and is commutative. But what we're looking for here is I want to prove this. I want to prove that if that's an entailment, then that's an entailment. It's easy to do, but the strategy is going to be something that we use over and over again. So I want to focus on what are the steps that we're going to take. Let's have a look. One important point to notice here is I'm not talking about any specific sentences here. X is any set of premises and A is any sentence and B is any sentence. Might be the same, might be different. We don't know anything about them. All we really know here is that we're basically saying any premises, some conjunction, any premises, the same premises, and that conjunction the other way around, okay? The particular A's and B's 
are completely arbitrary. So we have to be working with arbitrary sentences A, B. And if you think back to how we did natural deduction, that in effect allows us to prove something about any sentence whatsoever. So the strategy we're going to use to do this, it's, a, it's an if then, is we're going to assume the if bit and we're going to try to reason our way to the then bit. That might sound familiar. If you remember how we do natural deduction, whenever we have a conditional sentence, an if then, the rule basically tells us, assume the if bit, try and prove the then bit. Now that is when we've got an if then in logic. Here we've got an if then written down in English with logical notation, but the same strategy applies, okay? We're going to write it out not in natural deduction symbolism, we're going to write it out pretty much in English with logical symbols, but the strategy we're going to use is the same as we did in natural deduction. So if you if you don't remember that or you want a refresher on how natural deduction works, go and have a look at this video here because a lot of the strategies that we use in natural deduction, we're also going to use when we're doing metalogic. So that stuff's going to come in useful. Okay, so let's see how we can set this proof out. So if it's an if then, I'm always going to start off by assuming the antecedent, the if bit, and also I'm trying to conclude with the then bit. So the last line I'm going to write down is, so, okay, so I, I haven't got there yet. That's where I'm trying to get to. So what I'm trying to do is fill in the gaps between them. Okay, how do I get from here to the next line? Well, we've got this thing here. We've assumed that premises entail this conclusion. What does that mean? Well, we've got a specific definition of entailment. Now, this is going to depend on which logic we're in. So let's just assume that this is a question about propositional logic, where we're dealing with valuations, okay? So for premises to entail a conclusion, that means that for every valuation, if it makes the premises true, it makes the conclusion true as well. So our next line can be plugging in that definition. Okay, so for all valuations V, if that valuation makes the premises true, then it makes the conclusion true. This bit here, I've written Vx equals true. Okay, that's a bit of a shorthand. X is a set of sentences, not a specific sentence. But this, you can take that as meaning that for all sentences in that set X, for all premises, the valuation makes them true. We can also do the same thing working from the bottom upwards, okay? So we have to arrive at this conclusion about entailment. So we know that the second last step, the penultimate step, has to be something about all valuations. It's basically going to be exactly the same as this. So for all valuations V, if the premises are true on that valuation, then so is the conclusion. The conclusion here being B and A. So our job now is to link up these two lines. How are we going to do that? Well, again, think back to natural deduction. We're trying to prove something about for all, in this case, for all valuations. How do you prove for all? Well, you assume that you've got an arbitrary one. So we're going to take an arbitrary valuation. In particular, we're going to take an arbitrary valuation that makes the premises true and see if it makes that conclusion true. Now, I'm not writing down here, let V be an arbitrary valuation. I'm just saying that V makes the premises true. V's come from nowhere, so it's kind of implicit that it is an arbitrary valuation. If you want, you can write out, let V be an arbitrary valuation, but that's a step that I'm not going to do here. So we've got this valuation that makes the premise true. Since it makes the premises true, then it's going to make A and B true. And we're going to need a little bit more room here. OK, so this valuation, this arbitrary valuation makes a conjunction true. And what we know about conjunctions is if the conjunction's true, both bits of the conjunction are true. So V makes A true and it makes B true. And when a valuation makes two things true, it also makes their conjunction true. In particular, it makes B true. It makes A true. So it makes B and A true. Let's just recap what we've got so far. We assumed something up here and we ended up with this interim conclusion here. Now, again, if you remember back to natural deduction, if you assume something and you end up with some interim conclusion, you can introduce the conditional. If the first thing, then the second. So from if this to then this. 
So let's just add that in. OK, so we've got this conditional. If the premises are true, then that conclusion is true on that arbitrary valuation V that we introduced as part of our assumption up here. Now, because that was the first time that specific valuation was introduced in this proof and we've got this conclusion about it, we can use, in effect, all introduction to say, well, that holds for any valuation, right? If it holds for this arbitrary one, then it's going to hold for all of them. So for all valuations V, if this thing, then this thing. OK, and then we've already got from there to there. And then finally, I'm just going to copy out the thing we're trying to prove down at the bottom so that the thing we're trying to prove is our last line. Let's just recap exactly what we did there. We've got an if then. So we assumed the if bit and we tried to get down to the then bit. We did that by replacing the definition of entailment with something about all valuations. So that line comes from there. And similarly, we did the same job down here. So that line comes from there. We then want to get from there to there. This is about all valuations. So we assumed we've got this arbitrary valuation, which makes the premises true. Since it makes the premises true, it makes the conclusion true. Since it makes A and B true, it makes A true on its own and B true on its own. Since it makes them true, it makes B and A true. We assumed something and we proved something from it. So we can conclude if the first thing, then the second thing. That holds for an arbitrary valuation, so it holds for all valuations. This thing about all valuations is the definition of entailment. So the premises entail this conclusion. We assumed that we got to that, so we can conclude if then. And that was the thing we were trying to prove. So a really simple bit of logic there, but there's lots and lots of steps. Pretty much all of those steps are either a bit of natural deduction or kind of the meta-logic equivalent of natural deduction, or they are replacing a symbol with its definition, like replacing something about entailment with the definition of entailment. Many, many meta-logic proofs you're going to do are going to have that kind of format. It's going to be an if-then, so you're going to assume something, you're going to try and get to it down the bottom here, and the next line and the next line up are going to be taking entailment or a proof or whatever and replacing that with its definition. The stuff in the middle is then just a little bit of trying to work your way around it, perhaps assuming an arbitrary valuation or something like that. So an awful lot of the examples that we're going to work through are going to have this kind of format. So take this example that we've worked through here as kind of like a template because it's going to come up again and again and again. Now, one thing I want to add here is that when you look through some metalogic proofs, you won't always see all of these lines written out. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of assumed that we know what we're doing here. So we kind of leave a little bit of it out. For example, we might not bother writing down this line here where we're saying for our specific valuation, if then, we might jump to the, well, for all valuations, if then. So we're kind of combining two steps in one. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching this far. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment down below. If you're enjoying this stuff, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications. Next time, I'm going to be talking you through some more meta logic. We're going to be looking specifically at the deduction theorem, what it is, why it's useful, and how you prove it. I hope to see you back for that. <laughs>